Tonight on Joy News Prime, minority calls the bluff of special prosecutor as he justifies decision to seek assistance of Interpol to arrest Samuel Adam Mahama. The least said about Martin Amidu's statement, the better. He himself, without even, there was no gun which he said, when he made the statement that he is being frustrated by appointees of this government. So what, what further statement, what further evidence do you need to, 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 to have that the whole uh, pol uh, this that is doing is political gimmicks? The special prosecutor insists his investigations into the Airbus bribery scandal has been thorough, discovering possible commissions of other crimes. Now, the police grants bail to Minister of Special Prosecutor Special Development Initiative after questioning. This has retrieved a weapon and ammunition together with license covering the weapon. Also in this bulletin, minority wants government to reverse directive to GBC and not simply suspend. The president's letter to her to suspend is neither here nor there. Let this be a warning to any minister, including the Ministry of Communications, that the minority will put them to account. And in business... We assess the 25-year-old retail feud in Ghana's retail market as traders clash again at cycle. DGC, we know what is going on here. Okay. There are a bunch of flyers. That, that no trader can lock a shop of another trader. So what the Ghanaians are doing, it's illegal. We don't have any farmland. What we have is circle. And what they are doing is killing circle business. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. We're live from our studios in Kokum Limne in Accra on your digital terrestrial TV because we're free to air on your DSTV channel 421 and Go TV channel 144. Many thanks for choosing us. In our very first story, Member of Parliament's Communications Committee, Samuel George, is urging government to fully abort plans to take back three channels of state broadcaster GBC on the digital terrestrial television platform. President Ekufuado has directed the Communications Minister to suspend the plans to allow for consultations after the National Media Commission ruled the move as unconstitutional. Sam George says the directive came late and it's not enough and that the president should get the minister to scrap the plan completely. I have seen the, uh, for want of a better phrase, uh, face-saving release signed by the director of communications, Eugene Ahen, at the presidency, saying that the president has instructed the minister to suspend uh, The Central Regional Police has granted bail to the Minister of Special Development Initiative, Mavis Howard Kumsen, after questioning. The gun she used at the scene of the incident at Kasua has also been retrieved. Last week's chaos forced Electric Commission officials and members of the public to flee for their lives. Correspondent Richard Kwejonyakun reports that the docket of the case has been forwarded to the Attorney General's office for advice. We'll go to him for some update, but first, here's Central Region Police Public Relations Officer Irene Opon. Kumsen was invited by the regional CID and together with the police and her lawyers, she was sticking through her statements. Police has retrieved a weapon and ammunition together with license covering the weapon. Currently, We'll be getting some update from Richard Kwejonyako from that um, area and also lawyer for Hawa Kumsen, Gary Nimako, who would also be joining us via Zoom for more. But before that, physician assistants are protesting a decision by the National Insurance Authority to bar private facilities they run from providing services to subscribers. They warn any such action can only mean a return to cash and carry or him in Terrier has more. <laughs> The Physician Assistance Association says the policy said to take effect next September is discriminatory. The NHI in the letter last year announced health facilities of physician assistance in private practice would no longer be enrolled onto the scheme. Despite several calls from regulatory bodies like Health Facility Regulatory Authority 
and the Medical and Dental Council for delayed implementation of the directive, NHI is bent on going ahead. David Donko uh, is the public much. relations Our officer of the association. Uh, the NHI in the later part of 2019 wrote a letter to all practicing physician assistants who are practitioners in chief in private practice that come June 30th, 2020, they will not allow their facilities to be used as places where patients who assess health care uh, on the National Health Insurance Scheme to, to as it may be, assess health care using NHIS card in those facilities. And we feel like it's, it's a very discriminatory act. If there is a, a problem or a systemic problem you want to cure, you should cure it across board. You don't target a particular group of people. And what makes it more alarming is the fact that the NHI, that's the National Health Insurance Authority, led by Dr. Lydia Selby, have not been able to prefer any reason, whether a scientific reason or as it may be any guesswork, for that particular singular decision they have taken. The physician assistance one of dire consequences if the NHI implements the directive as they contemplate on the next line of action. In all regions of this country and in all districts where we don't have government physical infrastructure, as in health facilities, where private facilities, mind by physician assistants, are operating, where people can go and present their NHIS card, come 30th of September, the ordinary Ghanaian who will be at the receiving end will not be able to use the NHIS card to assess these private facilities. It brings back cash and carry, which of course the NHI is to eliminate cash and carry because the NHIS give financial accessibility to healthcare and eliminate cash and carry. So as an association, we feel like this is a very unpopular decision by Dr. Lydia Selby and her NHIA, and we believe that the government should rather take keen interest in this. From Kumase, for Joy News, I'm Interia reporting. Let's stay in the Ashanti region because police in that region has invited Assistant Ed Master of a Jusu Secondary Technical School for questioning over the detention of two students in his office. Kofi Api allegedly forced the students to strip half naked and held them overnight for allegedly stealing the school's electric stabilizer. A taxi driver who spotted them attempting to scale a fence wall with the stolen item caught and handed them over to authorities. Ohim Interior once more has the rest of the story. One of the students drank liquid soap he picked from the detention room in what is believed to be attempted suicide. He started foaming from the mouth when the colleague shouted for help to attract teachers and students who rushed him to hospital. <laughs> Police described the assistant headmaster's action as illegal and condemnable. ASP Godwin Ahianyo is the public relations officer at the Ashanti Regional Command. One of the suspects we understand uh, took in some substance suspected to be uh, liquid soup and he fell unconscious and was taken to the hospital. The other suspect is also assisting police in our investigations. Whilst we also invited the said assistant master to uh, assist us. So they are collaborating with us, and I'm sure uh, at the appropriate time, uh, the outcome of investigation will be made known to the public. Because you can't put somebody in a room and lock the person overnight. By our laws, I don't think any uh, person can do that, unless a police officer or a security officer, if I may say so. He has no right. If somebody suspects somebody to have committed an offense, the appropriate place to send a person is the police station. You cannot take the law into and subject the person to any kind of treatment. Section 12C of the Criminal and Other Offenses Act 1960. Act 30 says, a private person may arrest without warrant any person who in his presence commits any offense in the nature of stealing or fraud. ASP Ahianyo, however, says the assistant headmaster abused the provision. Wherever you find a civilian uh, effecting arrest, which is his right to, you don't arrest and keep. You can't even keep the person over a, 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 an hour or two. Immediately you arrest, you inform police for uh, the suspect to be called. Or you send the suspect to the police station. Law is uh, spelled 
as it is, whatever anyone commits an offense. It's supposed to pass through the processes. So that at the end of the day, you end up in court and then prove your case beyond reasonable doubt. You can't just say, yeah, that's why we arrest suspect and we send them to court. We can't say because the person is uh, suspected to have committed an offense, we end up in no, it is the court that will determine the fate of the uh, accuser or the suspect. From Kumasi, for Joy News, Ohim Interia reporting. I'm back here in the studio. My name is Aisha Brahim. Let's head on to Central Region for our earlier story where the Central Region Police has granted bail to the Minister for Special Development Initiatives, Mavis Howard Kumsen, after questioning. The gun she used at the scene of the incident at Kaswa has also been retrieved. Last week's chaos forced electric commission officials and members of the public to flee for their lives. Correspondent uh, Richard Kwejonyaku joins me via Zoom with more on this. Richard, you spent hours at the police station today. What more can you report? All right, so we're having a terrible connection with Richard Kwejonyako. We'll try and get him back, but also on the other line is uh, Gary Nimakum, who is lawyer for Hawa Kumsin. Uh, Gary, I'm grateful for your time on Joy News Prime. Well, I'm told we lost Gary too. We'll try and bring both of them back on the story to get details on the story. We're told uh, that she was granted bail, but lawyer Gary Nimaku is also saying a different story. So when we get both of them, we'll get the truth. But all we also know that the docket has been forwarded to the Attorney General's office. Gary Nimaku will be telling us more on that when we finally reach him. Now, government has begun processes to convert the Kumasi campus of the University of Education, Winneba, into the University of Skills Training and Entrepreneurial Development. The university will have the mandate of training teachers in practical skills and entrepreneurship. A bill to allow for the conversation went through second reading in Parliament on Friday. Minister of State in charge of tertiary education, Professor Kwesi Yanka, says the move will ensure teachers are better trained but required skill. The bill is thus, the bill does provide the legal framework for the establishment of the University of Skills, Training and Entrepreneurial Development with a focus on providing a holistic training for teachers to equip the teachers with the requisite skills that meet the needs of the technical and vocational educational training system of the country. While there are many public universities in existence that offer courses and programs in various subjects. There is no public university dedicated to the training of teachers with the requisite knowledge, skills, and aptitudes to train students in technical and vocational education. The establishment of the university would therefore bring into focus the relevance of technical and vocational education and training to national development and the need to achieve excellence in that regard. The proposed university will develop to the level of awarding doctorate degrees in technical and vocational education and training, thereby providing a workforce with the requisite skills. This will undoubtedly increase productivity, encourage investments as well, reduce unemployment, and improve upon the socio-economic sector of the country. The bill is thus the bill does provide the legal framework for the establishment of the University of Skills, Training and Entrepreneurial Development with a focus on providing a holistic training for teachers to equip the teachers with the requisite skills that meet the needs of the technical and vocational. Minority and majority MPs won the institution renamed after business magnate and MPP Sawad Nana Akenting Apiamenka of Apino Soaps who died in 2018. Listen to Shama MP Ato Pamford and Wawa's MP Joseph Hilechere and Ato makes a case for the renaming. I think that this particular institution that we want to establish will help Ghana develop the skills of those people who are gifted and talented but who need to be trained who need to be developed. The tendency was for us to introduce a name other than what is here. I also want to say that at this stage I am going to move a motion also for us to name this university after 
a kentin a peer member an industrialist a lawyer statesman and many things with the establishment of this institution or this investing it will train people to train them and certify them for the industrial requirement of this nation mr speaker I also want to say a little thing in respect of the contribution made my senior by my senior uh, year lecturer. Apia Menka has contributed so much in the industry through Association of Ghana Industries and the nation as a whole, as an entrepreneur, as an industrialist, and as a, as a lawyer. I believe that qualifying and granting him that opportunity for us to name the investor after him would do this nation a great deal by, you know, encouraging other industries to do more for this nation. I think that this particular... We'll take a break on Joy News Prime. When we return, there is more. Help. Welcome back to Joy News Prime to the rest of our stories. And the Ghana Center for Democratic Development says the electorate holds the solution to monetization of politics in the country. Executive Director Professor Henry Kwesi Prempe says besides fueling corruption, vote buying deprives the citizenry of good quality leaders. He believes the current practice inhibits the country's development. Professor Prempe spoke on the sidelines of the launch of CDD's manifesto project in Kumase. Nanai Ojima has more in the following report. The recent vote buying issue involves Deputy Chief Executive of the Micro and Small Loan Center, Hajia Abibata Sani Zakaria, was cited in CDD's Corruption Watch Arm investigation to have used the center's fund to induce NPP delegates to vote for her in the recent parliamentary primaries. Across the political divide, financial and material influence of voters has become recurrent, though alleged corporates continue to deny such allegations. Professor Prempe prefers a solution. Candidate A thinks if I stop paying that money to that delegate, the other person will pay. So the only way to stop it is for us to get them both to agree that this is not the way to do it. But they will not do it until you and I tell them, look, if you sign on to this thing, we will reward you. We will vote for the candidate that, is or that doesn't pay for the primaries. There are big structural problems. What we are trying to do is just give the parties an incentive through the voters to do the right thing. Ten areas of interest have been highlighted in the document dubbed Manifesto Project, aimed at promoting responsive and responsible manifesto for development, governance, education and agriculture are among key areas of high interest. Former acting director of the Ghana Education Service, Charles Ahetochega, explains solving challenges with flagship policy free SHS should be answered. The last I heard was that competition grants had not even gone to basic schools. I mean, if competition grants have not gone, in the secondary schools, they are not getting the kind of quality food that they are having. So there are a whole range of uh, related challenges coming into this. And again, I'm always very instructed to say that the essence of what we have done today is not to highlight those ones. All we are saying is that, look, we have observed that there are some emerging challenges as political parties. How would you fix them so that we get a better delivery in terms of what you want to do for the people so that we can go forward? However, Professor Prempe believes this political campaign should focus on issues. He believes even though elections should be held high, governance remains ultimate. We call ourselves Center for Democratic Development. So obviously it means that we have chosen democracy as the way through which we must get development. What is missing in the middle is governance. So we're doing some of the democracy things right. We are having free elections. We are having uh, free media. We have multiple media and all of those things. But the outcomes are still not impressive. The missing middle is governance. And if we don't do governance right, we actually even stand the risk that even the democracy part we might lose. Not only are we not going to get developed, but we risk losing some of the gains we have made even in democracy. From Kumasi for Joy News, Nanaya Ojima reporting. 
I'm back here in Accra. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. Now, Special Prosecutor has justified his decision to seek assistance of Interpol to arrest Samuel Adam Mahama. Martin Amidu says his investigations have so far been thorough, unearthing possible commission of other crimes, including forgery. The Special Prosecutor has been on the heels of the brother of Mr. Mahama and three others who have failed to show up in his office to assist the probe. Joining me for this conversation is Evans Mensa. Evans, Evans, by the way, is head of our political desk at Joy News. How else has the special prosecutor been justifying his call for assistance from the Interpol? Well, he believes that um, Samo Adam Mahama is a fugitive um, running away from prosecution because in March he uh, published an invitation for him to appear before him to assist with investigations and that hasn't been complied with. And is the reason why, and we know, Adam Mahama is out of the jurisdiction. And so he chose to go that route. However, tonight, there is a, an update on the special prosecutor's efforts at getting Mr. Adam Mahama to appear. Uh, now we're learning not only to help with investigations, but to stand trial. Because he's written to the Foreign Affairs Ministry, asking the ministry to facilitate the voluntary uh, evacuation of Samo Adam Mahama from the UK to Ghana to stand trial mm. because he obviously knows that the uh, Foreign Affairs Ministry has arranged a flight uh, on the 27th of July 2020 mm. to bring Ghanaians who are stranded in the UK back to Ghana in the midst of COVID-19. He's written to the Foreign Affairs Ministry to leave the, through the, our mission in London to get him to voluntarily be on a flight. Okay. to Ghana. Now, he gives reasons for this latest move. He claims in the letter that he's written to the Foreign Affairs Ministry that his latest decision is because he's found that Adam Mahama's brother, who is John Dramani Mahama, has admitted in an interview with, radio, with um, Daily Graphic that he is indeed um, government official one. Now, I want to read that portion for you because, uh, of course, the NDC uh, rejects this, that there was any admission of assault in that particular publication. But the special prosecutor says, the officer's letter states, among other reasons, for the, for the letter to the set ministry, that some of Adam Mohammed's elder brother uh, of full blood, mm. who, without doubt, and the evidence available to this office, answers to the description of the elected government official one allegedly granted a, de a denial interview to the Daily Graphic, which published on the same uh, 20th of June 2020, fortunately, containing suspected admissions that he is the elected government official one referred to uh, in the UK judgment. Mm. Now, he says that serving appointees of this government have been unable to obtain a voice recording of this interview to enable this office to confront the former president mm. with his own admissions in the interview as answering to the description of the brother of Sama Mahama as intermediary five. Mm. He goes on to make the point that because of this particular suspicion he has, the former president Joe Mahama has admitted mm. It will be in the interest of Mr. Samuel Mahama to himself voluntarily uh, submit himself to Ghana for prosecution so that if he didn't do it, he clears his name in the court of competent jurisdiction. Okay. Um, but I guess most substantively in this latest letter, he calls him a fugitive, which, is, which changes the game. Yeah. Previously, it was simple an invitation, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I want to read that part because that part is so important. Mm. It says, quote, Samo Adam Mahama must be given the opportunity to voluntarily accept to return to Ghana and put himself upon the Republic of Ghana to vindicate himself and save this country of millions of foreign exchange from the public purse that must be expended to expedite him to Ghana from the UK mm. or any other country in the execution of the Interpol Red Notice issued against him as a fugitive wanted for prosecution as published on the 10th July 2020. For, for, from the look of this uh, letter, it looks like the special prosecutor is quite sure of what he's doing. And then he goes ahead to say that he's been able to uncover other, and I like to put it right, he says um, he's been able to 
an as possible commission of other crimes, including forgery. What more do we know about it? Well, uh, uh, let me take a quick break. Uh, when I return, we'll get into that. <laughs> Welcome back to Join News Prime. Let's continue that conversation. Special Prosecutor is justifying why he called the uh, Interpol to assist him in getting Samuel Mahama. In this letter, he talks about Mahama being a fugitive. Evan Smith is still here with me. He's head of Joy News's political desk. What more do we know about uh, that uh, fact of unearthing other commissions of crime, including forgery, Evan? Well, it's, um, he believes he's done some other work in, that uh, has shown that some individuals, even at a university, may be complicit in this, some issues of um, passport fraud, et cetera, that he's also uncovered. And so as far as the special prosecutor is concerned, the investigations seem as, the primary investigation is the Airbus. But as he, in this case, the Airbus, he has also uncovered uh, other uh, connected, what he believes to be possible crimes that have been connected, co con uh, committed, including that particular one with the forgery of some passport involving some students also at the, uh, at the university. Which I believe we'll be getting details as the days go by. Thank you so much. Um, Evan Spencer is head of our political desk. Let's go back to the Central Region Police uh, where it has granted bail to the Minister of Special uh, Development Initiative, Mavis Hawa Kumsen, after questioning the gun she used at the scene of the incident at Kaswa also has been retrieved. Last week's chaos forced electric commission officials and members of the public to flee for their lives. Correspondent Richard joins me with more on this. Well, we'll be getting Richard Kwejonya, we've lost him again, but Gary Nimaku is lawyer for the uh, minister, Hawa Kumsen, and he joins us also via Zoom. Gary, good to have you. What exactly happened at the police station when your client, Hawa Kumsen, was invited? Ah, Asha, good evening. How are you? I'm doing great, Gary. Right. Uh, I have listened to your reports and I have listened uh, widely to um, some reportage also on social media and other news portals. And uh, let me put this in very clear without any fear of provocation or without missing words. I am aware of invitation which was extended to Honor Hawa Kumsen. That was on Wednesday, which he, she informed me. But um, I told her I was so busy on Thursday, we couldn't go. So today we will attend the invitation uh, with the police at Central Region. So I know of invitation. I don't know of any arrest that was effected on the November of Parliament. Two, I am aware that when we went there, we, were, we had discussions with them, uh, very you know, cordial discussions we had with them. Uh, I'm not aware of any bill that was granted to the, to, the, to, the, to the minister. If they say there was a bill granted to the minister, they should show proof there was a bill granted to the minister. There was no bill. If you are not charged with any offense, if you don't write a question statement, I don't see how you can be, you know, be made to, to be given bail. I don't know about any bill. And so that, that just should be corrected. It should be corrected. The record should be sanitized and be corrected. Now, uh, divisional also, commander, um, Gary Nimako, the divisional, commander, the divisional commander actually said that she had been granted bail. Well, if the commander has said that he had been granted bail, I think that the record should speak for itself. I am a lawyer and I was there all throughout the occasion. I was there, I just got to Accra. In fact, I've been in Central Region the whole day, just got to Accra. So if there's any indication that the bill was granted, the question that you have, who granted the bill? Was it self-recognizant bill? Or was it a bill that was uh, was uh, given to the, to the minister on account of whatever? The information that I'm telling you reflects the record. If anybody doubts my mind, the information I'm giving you they should bring contrary information to buttress what they are talking about. So for you, what I'm saying is that what I'm saying is that I am aware of an invitation which we 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 we, we honoured. I am aware that we went there, we had discussions on the subject matter in respect of the discharge of the firearm, which she did because she was in fear of her own life, because she saw people trying to attack her, and in view of that, she she, she discharged the firearm according to her. The people flee, they went away. 
and she went away. You know, that is what I'm aware of. We so she, a, she was I mean, questioned. I, yes, I, she I, was I, I, questioned. You are looking beautiful. You are looking beautiful. Let me take my time to explain things to you so that you two will not. Thank you very much, Gary. <laughs> But yes. but but we know that the case has been um, transferred to the Attorney General's uh, Department in Accra. Were you the I'm one who I'm requested? No case going to Attorney General's Department. Okay. See, that is what I said. What's the reality? A lot, of, a lot of misinformation out there. The case is now being transferred to the regional, sorry, the police CID headquarters. The police CID headquarters, not Attorney General. There has been no investigation to conclude to go to Attorney General for anything. That's not the procedure. The procedure is that you investigate a matter. Having concluded with the investigation, you can now take the, the, the docket, all right, to Attorney General office for advice. It, it has not gotten to that stage at all. Where, where we are, it's, it's, it's too early a, a day to talk to Attorney General. So it's coming to the police headquarters for investigations to commence. Okay. That's so, the matter. So now you've transferred the, the you are transferring the case to Accra, correct? Yes. Great. Yes. So what next? But were you the one who requested that it's been transferred to Accra or how why was it transferred to the headquarters? The police themselves said they are bringing the case to Accra. Okay. So what they next for the case now that it's been transferred to Accra? Yeah, it means that when the time they need the honor minister, we will, we will, we will appear at the, at the headquarters, and then she will now formally write her statements. Already she's given an ordinary statement, per the records. So when we go to the headquarters, we will now write any statement that they done, whether it's a caution statement or otherwise, we will now write. And if they want to grant bail, they will grant bail. As it stands now, there is nothing called bail has been granted or not been granted. There's nothing like that. So you don't so know. I tell you that the bail has been granted, first one there, that statement is powerful for falsehood. It's not true. But you don't know when you're going to the headquarters for this case. You're still you're waiting for the police. Well, we'll go there when the doctor comes back. All right. I'm but grateful Asha, for your time. I, Gary in the make this point very clear. You know, this matter is being overblown. You see, it's been overblown. I, I think that we should situate the thing within a certain context. There is a woman who has gone to you know a place where they are doing registration and doing monitoring and going around. It's not like a man. And then she reasonably believes that her life was in danger for people who were holding machetes and cutlasses and all that. And then in view of that, she discharged a firearm, a warning shot. I'm sure, I'm sure the police will investigate this as she gives her statement to the police. We'll be following that case. But I'm grateful, Gary Nimako, that you were able to join us on Joy News Prime. There were also yet another clash today at the tiptoe lane at the Nkrumah Circle here in Accra. This time between uh, Nigerians and uh, Ghanaian business people. We'll bring you all the details in business shortly. <music> Hello everyone, I am Sandra Isinamath and welcome to Business. There was yet another clash today at Sipto Lane at the Kwame Nkrumah Circle here in Accra. This time it was between local retailers who seem divided over whether shops belonging to undocumented foreign retailers be opened or not. While some were in favor of the move, others disagreed, resulting in a chaos. President of the Ghana Union of Traders Association, Guta, Dr. Joseph Obeng, was at the scene and called for calm but predicted more classes should governments fail to enforce Ghana's retail law. Charles Haiti was our man on the ground. It was a state of agitation here at Nkrumah Circle in Accra. Ghanaian traders clashed against each other over their foreign counterparts. They are all lying to you guys. They are not saying the truth. They are lying to you guys. We are the indigenous here. We know what is going on here. They are a bunch of liars. That no trader can lock a shop of another trader. So what the Ghanaians are doing, it's illegal. We don't have any farmland. What we have is circle. And what they are doing is killing circle business. Right now, all the market has moved from Medina, Tadesi, that's what happened. If they are doing the whole Ghana, we don't have a problem. It all happened when the task force mandated by the trade ministry to close shops of, of undocumented foreign retailers were allegedly found reopening some of these shops. 
The development has created a faction among these traders, with some Ghanaian traders for the reopening and a larger amount as seen in red t-shirts against the reopening of the shops belonging to foreign retailers. The exchange fists and harsh words. It took the president of the Ghana Union of Traders Association, Guta, Dr. Joseph Obin, to call for calm. I'm calling it off because the trade minister have talked to the leadership yesterday and they have sure that the task force will go by the roadmap that have been given to them. The exercise is going to go all over the country, not only circle. So I want that understanding to be clear. So it's not an enmity that is here between the circle people and, and, and the rest of the uh, traders. The trading community is embedded with this problem and we need it solved. Now, if you look at what is going uh, on, if care is not taken, a great mayhem is going to be falling on this country. The development attracted some police presence, although they had a hard time calming tensions. DSP Abraham Kwe heads the Nima Police Division. Some members, partly from Guta and partly from the civil society, were massing up. So when you inquire from them, you learn that Guta wanted to uh, relay a message that they received from the Minister of Trade during their meeting yesterday. So the essence of the meeting was to relay and to ask them to come to do some demonstration. I understand there's also another side, opposing side, which is also against Guta, and uh, we are trying to maintain law and order. This is just one of the instances of clashes that we've seen in the course of the year. And for the presence of Guta, Dr. Joseph Bain, things could get worse if government does not intervene anytime soon. I'm Charles Aita reporting for Joy Business. <laughs> The Secretary General of the International Chamber of Commerce, Emmanuel Dene Kwame, joins me via Zoom for more on this development. Thanks for your time this evening, sir. It's been 25 good years of feud in the retail market. Have we failed as a nation in enforcing our own retail laws? I wouldn't say yes or no. Um, it's captured in the GIPC Act, A65, and it's quite clear. And that uh, petty trading is raised, but uh, we all know international bet price also frowns on sectorial discrimination in uh -huh. the implementation of investment treaties. So um, I will ask for more dialogue uh, between the various parties. Um, the most important thing is that the so-called foreigners are uh, being referred in here. Uh, can they be described as investors? That's the first thing. And then uh, if they are ECOWAS citizens, um, we know ECOWAS also has its own investment policy. That's a bit quite clear that you need to take steps to reduce trade policy uh, uncertainty as well as increase trade policy predictability for investors mm. in order to guarantee sustained investment flow into your country. So, um, be it foreigners, be it equa citizens, uh, we need to be a bit flexible. But I believe it's more to do with dialogue. Uh, if it's Nigerian traders, we've been trading with them for a very long time. Mr. Uh, Dene, I'm asking this whether we've failed because it's been 25 years, this dialogue, we've not had it. We've had this since at, the, at our market centers for quite so long. Some have suggested that, yes, of course, we have our domestic laws and we are also uh, signatory to a lot of... Um, uh, treaties on the continent like ECOWAS that you mentioned, which one is supposed to supersede? We have our domestic laws. We also have that of ECOWAS. In this case, how do we ensure that uh, domestic laws are respected and also we respect that of the international community? Once, Once we've not amended ours, then ours still stick. And mm. uh, I think Guta has a point. You know, there's been a call for some amendments to that direction. I know the CEO of... Uh, of GIPC did mention that it's about time we 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 work on our act itself. And I remember people also raised the issue of the African continent of the area. There are supposed to be negotiations on investment. But I would want more dialogue between the parties because um, let's put the act itself aside, but to to get members of Guta itself to, to organize themselves. And okay, so, so quickly your, before we go, uh, that call for our laws to be re-looked really at, is it something we should consider and what form should it take and also with 
Ghana hosting the Secretariat for the Continental Free Trade. These things that we are seeing on our market centers, how is that likely? And what kind of signal is it sending to the rest of the African community? Uh, I say it's sending any wrong signal. It's quite similar to the routes we saw in South Africa. It's, it's a bit, you know, when people are disadvantaged, definitely they will react. Um, what what I know practically on the ground is that yes, previously traders used to go to Nigeria to pick up uh, goods to sell, uh, and then uh, the so-called wholesalers themselves are in, are in town trying to do some retail, mm. and uh, that sparked some tension, you know. And uh, with the COVID restrictions, instead of goods going to Nigeria for people people to bring them in, it seems they just ship these things in. Yeah, okay. the difference is also about 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 competition, you know, the way we do business. Our margins may be high. They are prepared to to reduce their margins. And okay. uh, once you go all right. Unfortunately, we have to leave it here too. Uh, we'll come back to that story because it's an issue that is bothering everybody. we we'll move on to other stories now. And another lucky customer of the weekly Wutri lottery draw has won 20,000 cities. That my summer business school teacher, Eric Yebwa Ohemeng, who received his check, has been speaking to Joy Business in the following report. An Amasaman based school teacher has emerged the unique prize winner of last week's draw after he had a shine of luck. Presenting his winning prize, Head of Customer Experience Richard Akutobanfo noted that the jackpot can be done through the mobile phone without hassle. Star 787 has just come to change mobile dynamics in Ghana. With Star 787 has, you do not need to stretch your head to get lucky numbers. All you need to do is to pick your phone down, star 787 hash, and you could win 218,500 Ghana cities. What makes us different from other mobile lottery? All you have to do or know is that it is your mobile phone number that enters the draw. With star 787 hash, we do prompt payment. Once you win, instantly you are rewarded with your prize. There is no libi libi, no laba laba. Everybody can win with star 787 hash. We have amazing category prizes with, for everybody. All you have to do is to dial star 787 hash. You could win 218,500 Ghana cities, 20,000 Ghana cities, 1,000 Ghana cities, and other amazing category prizes. So take your chances now. Winner of the prize, Eric Yeboah Ohemen says he will be using the funds to further his education and take care of other personal expenses. When I saw it, I tested for some weeks before I was able to win. So how much, how much are, we, are you winning and what are you going to use the fund for? I won 20,000 Ghana CDs and I'm going to use the fund to further my education. And I've started some buildings, so I'll continue the building and finish and use some for my family. The new lottery system is done through a mobile short code of star 787 hash. Congratulations to Eric. You may also want to try your luck next time. And that's how we wrap up the first part of business. I'm back with more after 8 p.m. Thanks so much for watching. And now to the rest of our stories. And the National Democratic Congress and its former Deputy General Secretary, Kokwani Do, have held separate ceremonies to commemorate the 8th anniversary of the death of former President John Evans Atamels. Kokwani Do, who doubles as Chief Executive Officer of the Atamels Institute, left the Asumjay Park after his event. Former President Rawlings had also visited earlier to pay his last respect. At the event organized by the NDC, former President John Mahama pledged to continue the fight for peace and unity in Ghana. Well, earlier, um, the Atamos Institute um, organized a commemorative event here. It was also a writ laying ceremony. So, in the background, you can see um, a writ from the Atamos Institute, His Excellency President Anana Danko Akufor, and the people of Ghana, and then a writ also, you know, from the family. Um, earlier, uh, we had um, the former president of Ghana, Jerry John Rawlings, who was here, he did not lay a writ, he just put um, flowers on the tombstone, and that flower is actually um, still um, there. We can hear from Koko Anido, who is the chief executive officer of the Atamos Institute. I worked for a good man. He had faith in me. I wasn't jobless, I wasn't homeless. I come from a good home, good background, good education. I had skill, I had talent. God gave me. President Rose noticed my skills, noticed my talent. 
and decided that he was going to use it to the best of his ability. I'm not saying I'm faultless. He was a father. So he kept me, he taught me. We ran a campaign, we won an election. We had a vision. We had a direction. We had dreams for this nation. Somehow, God decided to call him to rest. But in the book of, in the Bible, when Moses had to go, Joshua was told to get up and take the mantle. Maybe I've been behaving like a, a Jonah for so long, running away from what destiny has for me. I've ended up in the bellies of whales, and I've ended up in the bottom of ships. I've been vomited on seashores, and now I set my destiny. I have a duty and a role to perform in this country via the Atamus Institute, and I'll do it for God's kingdom to be established. Quite a number of NDC bigwigs um, attended today's event. There was a first event organized by the Atta Mills Institute, headed by its chief executive officer, Koko Anidoho. After that ceremony, another ceremony, which was this time organized by the NDC, happened here. President Mahama, who has been speaking, pledged his commitment um, to ensure the unity of this country. I stand today before the tomb that holds the mortal remains of the Asumjehene, the King of Peace. And I pledge that I'll continue his fight for the peace and unity of this country. May his peace and grace guide us as a party to the victory we so desire in the elections of December 2020. So that as a party and as a leadership, we shall restore to this country the peace and unity we once enjoyed. The chairman of the NDC, Samuel Oposo Ampofo, has also been speaking at today's event. He says at a time that we've witnessed a lot of violence during the voter registration exercise, we need someone like the late President Mills to calm the tension. In this moment of real challenges in which there is widespread violence and lawlessness just because we are writing our names in order to be able to cast our votes. John Evans Atamels, the peacemaker. John Atamels, the Prince of Peace, is who we need to calm the waters. I've also been speaking to member of parliament and NDC member Elan Tevandapur and what he makes of the violence that has characterized um, this year's voter registration exercise. President John Dramani Mahama made it clear that the person we are celebrating today live for peace, live for unity, and live for one Ghana. But today, we are all witnesses to the forms of violence, brutalities, impunity that is going on in the country. We are all witness the fact that the laws in the country now are specially made for some people. Independent presidential aspirant Marie Kofi Ghani says a government under his administration will prioritize and harness education to make people employable. He's also promising to roll out skills, training and farming for cooperative programs as a way of addressing the unemployment problem problem in the country. Launching his manifesto for the 2020 election dubbed the Ghanaian agenda earlier today, Mr. Ghani, a chartered accountant by profession, promised to offer Ghanaians a Ghana that works for all, quality education that reaches every child, and a quality health care system, among others. Listen. Now, this agenda will first and foremost for me deliver a Ghana that works for all of us, not just a few. And I've often said that if this agenda delivers nothing more than just that, we would have 
delivered more than we have had in the last 27 years. Number two, this agenda will deliver quality education that reaches every child across every region in this country. An educational system that equips our youth with practical, technological, and entrepreneurial competencies to increase not only their employability, but also their self-reliance. It certainly would be an educational system which guarantees the continuous improvement and development of our teachers. The way I see it, our children need to be positioned into the future. Number three, this agenda would deliver quality health care and quality health care systems that focus on primary and preventive health care. One that ensures that our valuable human resources do not die unnecessary deaths out of preventable diseases and the rest. Also live on Joy News Prime. Remember, we are free to air because we are on your digital terrestrial TV. Up next is editorial with um, Araba Kumsen. She's right here. Stand by. Now, the story of Minister of State Mavis Howard Kumsen firing a gun at a voter registration center in Kaswa has dominated headlines from the start of this week to today and is still the topic of discussion on the lips of many. The implications of this act cannot be underestimated and as a station that advocates peace, especially going into the elections, we cannot stay aloof. The minister, who is the incumbent MP for Ewutu Senya East, said she heard about the disturbances at the Steps to Christ Registration Center early in the morning, but she took no steps to relay this information to the police to intervene. Rather, she took the law into her own hands. Eyewitnesses shared horrific tales of how the thugs accompanying Madam Kumsen brandished guns and pepper spray, firing into the air and into shops. They spoke of how she stood and looked on while her boys visited mayhem on the people. See, she's telling her not to run away. Nothing is going to happen. Whilst people are pulling raffle, shoot. Now, this is a nation run on the principle of the rule of law. In fact, we have a president who is on record as saying he has been fighting for the rule of law all his life and that under his leadership, he will bring meaning to it. The presidency remained quiet whilst all this unfolded. Assuming the claim that people unknown in the area had come in to register is true, that is very unfortunate. But the very constitutional instrument, CI 126, guiding the registration exercise, makes provision for party agents to challenge anyone they suspect should not be registered. This law was passed by Parliament, the very institution Madame Kumsen belongs to. So why didn't she consider getting her agents to pick challenge forms to block the registration of the individuals she suspected had been bussed to the place? She is a minister. She has access to the top hierarchy of the police. So why did she not resort to the law enforcement officers? Listen to her explanation. But but who access to the top hierarchy need to be honourable. Hmm. Of course, the action has been widely condemned by many, including several bodies such as uh, the Ghana Bar Association and the Christian Council of Ghana, as well as security experts. We need to create, send a signal that says certain behaviors by people in public office cannot and must not be accepted. The right thing to do is either to resign or for her to be recalled 
by whoever appointed her. But in a nation divided along political lines, wrongdoing easily gets justified when it is committed by a member of one's own party. And we see this with the MPP chairman, Freddie Blade, defending the Ewutu Senya MP. She felt that it was a lady. The story that she's saying, which I have no reason to, to believe otherwise. And I felt very threatened. She was defending herself. And he didn't shoot at anybody. He fired a warning shot to keep people, to ward off the people who were coming to close home. I'm told one of them used a motorbike to hit a car. That now, this is worrying when you consider the fact that the MP's action could result in reprisals. And already we have, uh, we've been hearing negative responses from the NDC, which is calling on its members to mobilize and respond in equal measure. That is equally reprehensible and should not be you know, tolerated. It should be condemned in no uncertain terms. Today, the Central Regional Police Command invited Madame Kumsen for questioning, and she had been granted bail. Together with the police and her lawyers, she was sticking through her statements. Police has retrieved a weapon and ammunition together with license covering the weapon. So even though she admitted firing the gun, she has not been charged. The docket, we are told, has been forwarded to the Attorney General's office for advice. Hopefully, it won't become one of the several cold cases languishing in the bosom of the CID. The Howard Kumsin debacle has unnecessarily heightened tensions and made rubbish of the very document her party, the governing MPP, and others appended their signature to, to uphold the peace at all times, especially during the electoral process. A government priding itself as champions of rule of law must be seen to be doing just that, championing it and not just paying lip service to it. Let us live the reality of the rule of law and not the rhetoric. And let those who flout the law with impunity be made to pay for the consequences of their actions. That is certainly not too much to ask. You're still watching Joy News Prime. Let's wrap up with business for tonight. Government has moved to establish a national unemployment insurance scheme. Finance Minister Ken Oferiata during the mid-year budget review announced that the scheme would target employees during unexpected job losses. The scheme also aims to provide temporary income support to workers who have been affected by the COVID-19 outbreak in Ghana. But how feasible is this insurance scheme? I have been joined by insurance practitioner, Justice Bepra and labor expert Austin Gami for some conversation around this very um, topic. Good evening, gentlemen. Thanks so much for your time this evening. Good evening. Okay, so um, I think I have Justice, or do I also have uh, Mr. Austin Gami? Okay, good evening, gentlemen, once again. Let me start with you, first of all, um, Justice. What do you, you make of this unemployment insurance scheme as an insurance person? Thank you very much for this opportunity, and good evening to your listeners as well. <laughs> uh, I think two months ago, barely two months, a month ago, I actually wrote on this unemployment insurance or job insurance. And uh, I think that it's hard time. I mean, we have to have this. In other jurisdictions, they have used insurance to resolve a lot of social issues. So in my in my letter, I wrote something that in case we didn't have the national pension, that is net, what would have happened to people after, let's say, 60 years, they go on retirement? So we have seen that job loss or unemployment, I mean, is, is on the increase. But we have to find a way to resolve it. Mm -hmm. I mean, the first way is to create jobs, but we are unable to create enough jobs for people who come from school. And the same way, people also lose their jobs. And let's look at from the banking crisis, so people lost their jobs. And now COVID-19, which we're not expecting. I mean, so that is a risk. Also has come in and lots of businesses have gone down. 
and people have lost their job. So, I mean, this, when people lose their jobs, too, it also affects spending in the economy. So more or less, it affects the economy. So we need to have an insurance in place. So in short, you support this scheme, this right, income. Justice? In short, you are in favor of this uh, new insurance scheme for workers, right? I'm all for it. Okay, hold it. We'll I'm come to how it. this it will all... Hold it for me, Justice. We'll come to how it all works. But Mr. Austin Gami, let me bring you. In our last conversation prior to the media budget presentation, you were not sure how this scheme was um, going to work for several reasons, especially because we don't have any credible data on unemployment uh, in Ghana. Having listened to the finance minister yesterday in parliament, has your posi position changed? So certainly not not yet changed. Um, that is it's quite a good idea to have uh, an insurance uh, policy, uh, employment insurance policy in place. That is why we emphasize that. That is why we made provision in the labor law uh, for it far back as 2003 when it was first approved. But the reality is that to date we don't have the data. We shouldn't do anything in an ad hoc manner that will become an issue for us to be resolving later. I pray. I know how credible it is to have this kind of thing. It's some well thought of thing. Hence, like I said, it was put in the Labor Act Section 6. And we envisage that it will be open to a national uh, mm -hmm. discussion uh, to enable us to have a very, very credible uh, insurance policy for unemployment. So that when those of us will be contributing to us, it will not regret it. So we should not hurriedly do anything that will pose a problem for the nation tomorrow. It's a good idea, but I do not think it is ready to take off now. Okay, um, Justice, let me bring you back in here. I'm sure a lot of people will be wondering, um, in that presentation yesterday, it was not quite clear how this was going to be implemented, whether it's going to be shared between the employer and the employee or government to bear some sort of cost and then the employee also contribute some. As an expert in this field, how does or how will uh, an insurance scheme for unemployed persons work? Okay, actually, I'm waiting for their implementation guidelines. But from the letter I can say, uh, government even can't have it all. We can have, they can have the basics. And I expect the private sector also to take it up from there, that's the private insurance company. So what government even can have in place now could be uh, unemployment or job loss insurance due to, let's say, catastrophic losses or, let's say, um, fundamental risk, something like COVID-19. This one comes to affect a larger people. So this one, we can have the national ins uh, insurance. And I expect that maybe we can have uh, an independent body or group of people or an institution that will work I mean, in relation to this so that at least it was be different, separated from government. So normally, we can have experts together and as a uh, my colleague was saying, I mean, we need to have a lot of discussion on how we are even going to contribute, whether we are going to take a percentage. And even if you are talking about data, I mean, we can also start from Senate. So with the former staff, we can have a lot of data. We can know a lot of people who are working from there and start and see how best we can generate data also from that. Well said, Justice. So, Mr. Gami, um, quickly, yeah, well said. I think you've made your point. Mr. Gami, quickly before we go, let me ask you, in that presentation again, it was not too clear as to um, what will happen because we've been told that persons who've already lost their jobs as a result of the COVID-19 will also uh, benefit from this scheme. Do we know where the source of funding will be for those who are already gone? Because uh, for those who are still here, we'll be contributing towards that, right? Certainly not yet made known, but the reality is that what will be done with the COVID situation will be a complete situational management thing, and it will be a temporary thing. We have a very, very lasting program. When I say we, I'm talking about the time we're writing the Labor Act. We put in place a clear uh, assignment for the Labor Department whose name will have to be changed, structure will have to be rebuilt, Technology will be deeply introduced 
and data collection will be just a matter of course. When all that is in place, then the insurance people will come in, everybody, contribution by both private and public sector will be in. We do not need maybe government to be contributing uh, so much from national kitty in, in respect of this matter. The contribution will be done in accordance with the original plan that we have when we're writing the labor law. Okay, Justice, uh, quickly, I mean, Mr. Game has said that, yes, we do not have the data to embark on this exercise. You said you're in for it. Do you think that... Or don't you think that we need the appropriate system in place? I mean, I'm talking about data, credible data, before we embark on such an exercise. Exactly so. So I still believe that what the minister said is going to be temporary. And as Mr. Osengame said, we need to have a permanent one in place. And this permanent one can be even be developed to cover unemployment, let's say people who come from school and after their national service, they are unable to get job. They can receive even monthly money, some sort of money, as they are still looking for job. So it's a whole big thing that we can start from somewhere. But I'm sure what the minister talked about is a temporary something. Mm. But we need to have a discussion. We need to de begin to build the data and have a permanent one for job loss. And Isn't it not strange that you as an insurance person and before. also as a labor expert, you've not been engaged, there was no dialogue whatsoever as to what goes into this scheme? Yeah, to be, to be honest with you, um, really there's, there's really no dialogue in the meantime. This is purely a situational management, some kind of emergency situation. If it is said so, we will all go in for it. But there is a very clear and loud, precise program that should go with this kind of thing. And labor department is a department that will be changed, structurally changed, technologically changed, people skilled people, and they will collect this data. The insurance people will come in strong. It is not SNIT directly. Okay. Sneet data will be just a small thing. All right. Gentlemen, I'm sorry we have to leave it here. Justice Bepra and Mr. Austin Gami, grateful for your time this evening. We move on and Brent crude sold for $42.97 a barrel today. More in the Community News Update. business for the week with me sandra is in number that's more news when you log on to my online.com for a slash business i'm sandra s in do stay home stay safe and stay beautiful <laughs>